and if I did know what it was going to cost to be a father. To be a husband. Would I do it all over again? Before you get married, don't do that. <laughs> Are you Tell sure? You Just Look, your son's you. <laughs> Come on. Come here, Zachary. Nothing. You're not going to proclaim your everlasting love to her right now. <laughs> she knows I love her. Well, the first time I proposed to my wife, um, she told me no. <laughs> we were actually uh, five years old <laughs> when I proposed, and she told me no. Um, she uh, she said we were too young. Very wise woman. And uh, we, uh, we had known each other since we were two parents, family, friends. And um, so we, I had uh, stolen a, a brass bird from my mom to give to her and ask her to marry me on her fifth birthday. <laughs> and uh, she, she said no. And, and we, it was, of course, a cute story. She ended up moving away when, I was, when she was about six or seven. And we saw each other off and on. When I was uh, 15 and she was... Uh, she was down visiting. We we're at a party at a friend's house, and she got up and went past me to use the restroom. And as she did, I heard the Lord tell me, "That's the woman you're going to marry." And uh, of course, really freaked me out. <laughs> and um, she, uh, that, because we hadn't had much of a relationship and had been teased, and I was like, so I wanted to blow it off. But I ended up speaking with uh, someone who gave me some very wise counsel that just said, you know. If it's the Lord, then it'll happen. If not, then then allow allow it to go. Doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but um. when he's thirty and he has a pot belly, he'll look at this and he'll say, "Oh, you're so pretty," and y'all get all gushy and everything. <laughs> you nervous? <laughs> I'm not really that nervous yet, but I love you. And can't wait. Can't wait. That's good enough. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I really hate those things. She had uh, lots of things that, that every wife wants done <laughs> at their wedding. And um, I remember going through a lot of those things and feeling silly. <laughs> um, but I do remember taking communion as part of our ceremony. And that was, that was really special to be able to take communion with my wife. The first thing that we did as husband and wife was to take communion together. That's actually one of the things that, at right now, that I actually miss most is being able to, to participate in the Lord's Supper together. You know, I remember the first time they did it at church after my wife was in prison. It was just it was kind of a difficult thing. You know, something you do with your family, and you know, I wasn't able to do that. And it's kind of so I look forward to that. That's probably one of the most thing, one of the things that I look forward to most is, is being able to to celebrate communion with my wife.
the discussion about kids, huh? <laughs> um, I wasn't um, opposed to having a lot of kids, but my definition of a lot of kids was different than my wife's definition of a lot of kids. <laughs> so for me, it was like a large family would have been three. <laughs> and, you know, she wanted six kids. We have five. This is Emma, and she is three years old. Who's next? This is Sebastian. And he's five years old. Oh, I am Ellie, and I am seven years old. <laughs> she can say how old she's. And I am seven turning She said. I am Isabel, and I'm nine years old. I am Isaac, and I'm eleven years old. We met them right after they had gotten married, and then, and they weren't in our church at that point in time. And then the next time we saw them, uh, their mother was going to our church, and they visited. And then they had one or two kids by then, and we're thinking, "Wow!" <laughs> and then more kids and more kids and more kids, and so it, it became abundant, abundantly obvious to us that they weren't looking for the uh, American dream materially, but they were looking to. Uh, love on children, and uh, even though they wouldn't wouldn't have an abundance of material things, that these kids were obviously clearly very, very loved, and that was their priority. I think that's probably the most painful thing for her is being separated from her kids. You know, it's been a long, long time being separated from her kids and, and missing out on a lot of their life. And, you know, that's been the biggest sacrifice for her to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you, and it's going to cost me what I hold most precious. Adoption had been one of those things that we had discussed while we were even, you know, engaged in dating. We had talked about it even more, and, and just come to the point that we were wanting to be there for someone. And, and didn't want to have that selfish, to have such a selfish outlook on it that said that the children that we raised, that we loved, that we put our heart and soul into all had to come from us biologically. We wanted to be able to open our hearts and our homes and our family to another child. I've always known Hannah to say that she wanted um, I mean, that was in both of their hearts. That they wanted their own biological children and they wanted adopted children. And they would have had as many children. When she comes home, they're gonna have more children. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the plan. The first day that we had him was Mother's Day, and his foster mom, we didn't officially have permission to have him, but his foster mom called and said, it's Mother's Day, can he come and stay with his mom? And so he came over and he's like, mommy, 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 he was all excited to come and stay, and he didn't want to leave. And we, we just had a lot of fun that day. He ended up spending the night and actually never going home. <laughs> He kept spending the night, and then finally we got the papers completed. Well, before we even had Andrew in our home, uh, when we were telling everybody at church that we were going to adopt him, uh, we were confronted by a couple of his teachers, and they said, you know, you need, you need to realize that this is going to be a tough one, and uh, okay, you know. And, you know, but the, the things that they mentioned to us was that you know he, that he threw some fits that were kind of extreme, and that he uh, he had a, an eating problem of some sort, and nobody really understood what that eating problem was. But they just said, you know, be careful with him. You know, watch him that he doesn't eat out of the trash can. And then as he was actually in our home and staying with us, we began to notice just kind of some weird things that he would do. Um, eating wise. We noticed that you know, if there was a crumb on the floor, he would pick it up. We'd be in a restaurant and he'd be picking it off the bottom 
gum off the bottom of the table to eat. If he went outside, we had to bring the dog bowls inside because he would eat the dog food. He would walk into a parking lot and he'd be trying to pick up gum off the, off the thing. Or he would be picking cigarette butts off the floor or the ground and you know, eating them. And just some kind of gross things like that. So once we realized that, I, I felt like there was more of a problem. And so I, I, I mentioned it to my caseworker a little bit, um, and she you know, just reminded me, you know, remember that, you know, that he had a real rough background and he's probably just learning to trust and you know, he's going through this time where he's not, you know, he, he's, he doesn't understand that there's always going to be food there and he's, you know, he, he's in a new environment. So I thought, okay, I'm just you know, um, overreacting, I guess. It wasn't until we were actually, my wife was pregnant with Emma. We'd gone to the, to the doctor to get the sonogram and we'd taken all of our children with us. And it was really kind of a cool thing because we'd always taken our kids with us um, to see the baby and the sonogram. And um, so it was kind of a cool thing to actually take Andrew along with that so he could see his baby little sister. And um, so we were at that appointment and of course we leave and the kids are all asking questions. What's, the, what's going on? talking about their new baby sister, where is she going to sleep, and, um, and I was excited, my wife was excited, and um, I was talking to my wife and wasn't paying attention, and I ran a stop sign. blood all over my face. I had knocked my, my front teeth loose and they thought my jaw was broken. I was all swollen and everything. And being mommy, I didn't realize I was hurt. She instinctively turned around to see if all the kids were okay. And, and they were. But she, in doing that, kind of traumatized them. Because then they see mom with blood all over her face and they just had this scary accident. And when Andrew saw the blood and, the, and it saw me hurt, he kind of went into a shock of some sort. Um, I don't know, he just got real upset and real worried. And uh, they took the younger two girls and my wife in the ambulance and, and had them checked out the hospital and everybody was okay. Um, and Andrew and the boys were there and my parents actually came and picked them up. I remember talking to my mom and she said, you know, at that point, Andrew just wanted to eat. You know, was, he, he kept asking for more food. He would say, can I get something to eat? Is my mom okay? And those are the two things that, that my mother told me that he always, he said. He was talking about food. And he was asking if his mom was okay. And from that point on, we saw a real change in his behavior. Prior to that, we had seen some issues where he wasn't hung, when, when he had eaten enough, but he was still wanting food. When he would ask for things, he would try and take things out of the refrigerator, but it wasn't aggressive. We didn't see that aggressive thing until the accident. And then it became, he needed it. He just got, right, when he would get upset, and really usually what he would get upset about would be like if dinner was over and he wanted to eat. And a lot of people have asked us, you know, well, was he still hungry? But he'd eat twice as much, at least as our other kids, each, each meal, you know. And you know, Andrew was, you know, he was four years old and he could eat five pieces of pizza and be upset that you weren't giving him his six, a sixth piece of pizza. And um, we had tried even to allow him to eat until he was ready to stop. Maybe that will help him realize, okay, I'm not as hungry as I think I am. And I remember just making eggs and bacon and just kept doing it until, are you done? No. You want more? Yes. And I don't know, it was like a dozen and a half or two dozen eggs that I remember making for him. And he, he actually ate to the point that he vomited. And I thought for sure when we got to that point, okay, he's, he's done, he's, he's getting this lesson. He doesn't need any more food. And, and he said, I don't feel good, and he threw up. And then immediately he's, 
after he gained his composure from vomiting, he asked for more. And at that point, we were like, okay, we just got to stop this. He just had no idea of what, um, you know, how to control his appetite or his, you know, what hunger was. I, it just, I think that, you know, I mean, I understand now that that was a mental disability of some sort. You know, at the time, I thought that it was just because of his being so neglected, you know, that he just didn't understand. And so, you know, those were the type of things we were dealing with. And so, but at the same time, we had been told, Andrew, children that are in foster care often hoard food, don't feel like they're going to get enough. And it has more to do with emotion than it does anything else. The day that, that Andrew ended up going, taking him into the hospital, we ended up taking him into the hospital, um, had been a really long night the night before. He'd been up that night, he had actually uh, gone to the bathroom in his bed because he was upset because we weren't giving him what he wanted as far as food went. You know, a lot of times children that come from these broken homes have tantrums where they'll, um, you know, they'll, they'll defecate on themselves and they'll smear it all over the walls or they'll try to throw it at you or, you know, they, you know, and they just don't know how to handle whatever's going on and so they try to use it as a, a tool to get what they want. The day before, we'd actually taken his mattress off because of that and he was uh, sleeping in a sleeping bag. Initially, he was sleeping in a sleeping bag on, on his bed and then he was sleeping in a sleeping bag in our room on the floor. None of us had gotten much sleep that night, and I had to go into work the next day. Really, because Andrew had been so overwhelmed with everything, we had just, and Larry had called and said when he was coming to pick us up for the chiropractor, he said, how about if I come a little bit early and we go and just let you know, Andrew and Sebastian play at McDonald's for a little while, you know, can you handle sitting? And I was like, yeah, that, that'll be all right. And so I told Andrew we were going to do that. Well, he got upset that it wasn't immediately. Daddy wasn't home when I said that we were leaving and you know, that we were going to go to McDonald's. And he had to wait 15 minutes for Daddy to get home. And he got real upset about that. And he started crying. And he started banging his head on the wall and throwing one at a, a tantrum the type of tantrums that we had talked about, you know, just a real intense temper tantrum. And, and I, I um, gave in uh, and gave him a bowl of chili, uh, some chili that we had made the night before. I remember coming here, taking him to the chiropractor, and Andrew just throwing fits about anything and everything. And it's one of those those fits where he's, he's not getting what he wants, so he's not gonna be happy. And it was just the same thing that had been going on the night before. And I remember dropping him off back here. That was around two o'clock, 2.30, something like that. When we got in, he was very upset again because he didn't get to go to McDonald's. You know, we had made it back home and he hadn't gone to McDonald's. And so he was said, you know, he was still hungry, he wanted something else to eat, he, you know, and he started throwing another temper tantrum. And so I, you know, I was like, you want more of this chili? And he said, yes, so we made another bowl of chili. And, um, you know, Larry, Larry was getting his stuff together and really he, he left pretty quick after that. He needed to get back to work. I remember her calling me throughout the day just, still struggling with Andrew and, and just his his behavior hadn't improved any. I made him his bowl of chili, he ate that and he was still wanting more to eat and he was what he was saying he was saying he wanted he wanted to taste that stuff. He wanted to taste that stuff and he would he, he liked the flavor of the Zatarans. And he 
took a sip of it and didn't like it and threw it back at me. And then he changed his mind, said he wanted it, and I gave it back to him. He took another sip of it, and then he, he never he never finished drinking it. He took a couple sips, and that that broth had you know a couple of shakes of the seasoning in it. You know, a lot of what I was accused of is 24 tablespoons or something like that, but it was you know just a couple of shakes from the thing like. Probably the amount that would be in a pack of season from ramen noodles, at most. She called me a little while later and said he's not doing good. He's, he's having issues. I need you to come home and help me with him. He threw up, and I thought that he had thrown up just because he was so upset. And he had also eaten, you know, his second bowl of chili, and, and so when he first threw up, I called Larry and said, you know, Andrew has thrown up, he's throwing a temper tantrum, and I can't handle it. I'm in too much pain. I remember coming back and talking to a customer in the front yard, <laughs> and wasn't in a huge hurry to get in the door, and uh, She's coming in and she's got him and he's not really talking to her. You know, just the way I looked at it, he was worn out from everything that had been going on. And so that was immediately my, my first thought when he threw up was just that he was you know, throwing up from his temper tantrum. And I remember just the discussion back and forth. What do we do? Do we need to take him in? Should, you know, should we just wait this out? He just kept saying he was cold, he was cold. He wouldn't really say anything else. Um, but one thing you gotta know about Andrew is that a lot of times when he would get upset or when he would get, um, when he was uncomfortable, he would kind of close off in his answers. He wouldn't use a lot of words. Um, in fact, when he first moved in with us, he didn't use words very often at all. He would point to a lot of things and just, uh, 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 you know, and, and he was, because of his, de his developmental delay, but he, you know, wasn't using a lot of words, but I didn't think too much of it because of that. You know, neither my wife or I realized something serious was going on with our son until we were actually on the way. So I sat in the back seat with him, and Larry drove. We decided to go to uh, to not call 911. Um, part of the reason for that was that um, I was an EMT at one time, and uh, I never worked as an EMT. I went to school to be an EMT, and during that time, I knew I found out that you know, unless a child's vital signs are messed up, you know that if you call 911, you don't get lights and sirens. Every, you know, they just come at a normal speed, come to your house and pick, up, pick you up unless there's you know, been a sh shooting or there's been a, you know. So with, the, with Andrew the way he was at that point, I didn't feel like they, you know, we were gonna get to the hospital faster than they were gonna get to us. We got up to Everhart in Saratoga, which is you know, the next major block up. Where I could see the urgent care clinic where we were headed. And my wife said, he's not breathing. And, and he's like, what? And I said, he, he stopped breathing. And, and he's like, well, what do I do? And I started CPR immediately. Seeing her begin to perform CPR on, and then I'm thinking, okay, how do I get these cars to move? <laughs> and being stuck there at a red light. He was honking, my, you know, honking and screaming at the people and trying to get around. Trying to weave through traffic the best I can, and I'm still not getting it and couldn't get past anybody. So he hit speed dial on the phone and um, dialed a close friend of ours, an elder at the church, and told him, you know, we're on the way to the hospital. Andrew, just stop breathing, start praying. She gets out the front runs him in, and I go and park the car and get our son out, and then I go in afterwards. Nobody, everybody was just standing around. Uh, now, I, I'm not trying to 
make them look bad, but nobody was really doing anything. So I, I, I continued doing CPR. She's in the back performing CPR on our son while doctors are running around looking for knives and to cut shirts and <laughs> other stuff that they're doing back there. Nothing was accomplished. No tubes were put down in Andrew or anything like that until the uh, ambulance showed up. I remember watching, sitting out front, as the fire truck pulls up and the paramedics get out and they run in the back and they're working on him. And he leaves and he goes over to the hospital next door in the ambulance with my wife. And my parents take me in the car and drive us over there. While we were there at Spawn, they got his heart beating again. Um, the doctor came out and said, you know, your prayers are working. Your baby's doing okay. It looks like you know, he's. It looks like he's breathing again. They eventually led us to go in to see him, and, and we're just seeing his little body lay there, with tubes running in and out of him. That was the last time I saw Andrew. Um, he was just had tubes everywhere, and people working on him all over. Um, but at least the doctor let me come in and, and just tell him I loved him and be with him for a little while. Uh, they transferred him from there to uh, the Driscoll Hospital because Spun South also was not equipped to handle a child in crisis. When we got to that hospital, they said that he wasn't stable enough for us to go back in there and see him. And um, so we were waiting for him, for them to stabilize him so we can go in. We went into the uh, a little conference room. And as we got there, there were police officers there that said they needed to interview us. And the doctor said, no, I need to find out what's going on. Let me, let me talk to them and find out what, what's been going on. So we sat down with the doctor and uh, he, uh, he began to ask us what's going on. And, and it was at that point that they told us that, that Andrew was brain dead and that they didn't expect him to make it very much longer. Quickly after that, we were escorted away from the hospital. Um, we were told that they needed statements so that they could help him find out what was wrong with Andrew. Of course, we hadn't done anything wrong, so we didn't think we had anything to hide. We wanted to do everything we could to help Andrew, so. Immediately, they had taken my wife down to the police station for an interview, and um, another officer took me back to the house so they could go walk through the house. My pastor went with me, and my mom went with me. But the, the cop wouldn't let them come in or anything. He made them sit outside. And then they took me down to get a statement from me. Well, the statements turned into interrogations. By the time I had got there, they had already been interrogating my wife for about an hour. And um, you know, they took a statement from me, which was very much less aggressive um, than, than the way they were pursuing my wife. I was interrogated for three hours. Uh, when they first read me my rights, I was like, well, if that's what this is about, I want to go and see my, I want to go and be with my baby. You know, because it says, you know, you can terminate this interview at any time. I said, I want to terminate this interview. I want to go be with my baby. And I was like, no, 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 no. You need to come, you need to tell us what's going on so we can help him. What, they, what do you think caused that? He said he was mad. Yeah, but why do you think he was mad? All of a sudden he's mad. He's been fine, he's, he's been going good. along perfect, and then all of a sudden he goes downhill. Why? I really don't know. It's been since the accident. I remember them coming in with the other detective that had been in interviewing my wife. and I, I don't even remember specifically what he began to say. They were trying to say that I had done something or that Larry had done something or something. I didn't really understand what we were being accused of, but I knew that they were treating us like we had tried to hurt him. At that point, I realized, okay, this guy's made up his mind about what he thinks, and we just gotta get past this. At the end of the interview, they had CPS come in, and they told us that while they were 
investigating and trying to figure out what was going on, that they needed to know that the kids were in a safe environment, that if we didn't give them permission for the kids to stay at Jessica's house, Jessica's my sister-in-law, um, that they would get a judge's order and they would take the kids and put them in foster care. Not knowing better, that's what we ended up doing. We ended up signing over that custody to family members. And they told us that we weren't allowed to see our kids for a month, or at least until we got in front of a judge and he changed it, or until the case was resolved. And they told us we weren't allowed to go back to the hospital to see Andrew. And of course, we didn't want to go home. You know, a house that had been filled with children where one of our sons had been sick. And, you know, it was just a, what do we do? It was a year of our life, practically, between our son dying and us actually facing the trial. You know, we, we truly expected a, a pretty quick verdict. We didn't expect them to take very long. And uh, the first day passed. And I remember just anxiously sitting and waiting. And, in the lawyer's office, kind of across the street from the courthouse, waiting for that phone call. And uh, then having to go back the next day. And I remember getting that phone call that they finally had that decision and, and just that anxiousness of, okay, I mean, that just everything kind of boils up to that. And they had my wife rise for the verdict, and they said guilty. I just remember it just sinking and I just broke down in tears and they gave us a, a couple of minutes there just to say goodbye and we were just sitting there holding her and crying with her and they let me take her wedding ring and they took her away So we find ourselves in this crazy situation where we're sitting there just wondering what train just hit us. This woman who is just on any level a spectacular Christian, a humble woman, loving the Lord, loving her family, and uh, not wanting to live some spectacular life, but just being a good Christian, desiring to be on the mission field. And um, all of a sudden, she finds herself found guilty certainly not guilty, but found guilty of murder and put in prison for life without parole, without the possibility of parole. And we are dumbfounded. At the same time, understanding and knowing that God is good. That's one thing that we never let go of. And knowing that there was a plan. I can't always understand God's plan, but I can always trust his heart. God has proven to me that He loves me and that He is a good God. And you know, all throughout the Bible you see God doesn't always make life easy for everybody. It's not like He's some genie up there. And we live in a hurting world because of man's sin. And we have to deal with suffering and we have to deal with all that stuff, but it breaks God's heart to see His children cry and to see us hurt. Ultimately, the question is, why would, why would God allow bad things to happen to redeemed people as opposed to good people? 
but, but why would God allow his children that he loves to go through trials, uh, ultimately for the better good for all of eternity? If we, if we are only focused on the earth, if we're only focused on the things of this world, we should be in despair, says Paul, if that's all there is. But the truth is, God has a plan beyond this world, beyond um, what we can see. And His plan is to form us into the image of Christ for all of eternity, that we may enjoy Him all the more for all of eternity. And so, our commitment to Christ, our faith, um, is tested so we know where we stand with God. And God becomes more real in trials than He does in good times, because He sustains us. And as you go through trials, you're amazed at times when you can be sustained, because without Christ, you would crumble. And he shows us where our faith is. I know, I know people out there are like, how can you sit there and say, you know, God is good when you're going through such a mess? And my question is, how could I not? You know, I mean, look at my children, look at me, look at my wife, and, you know, are we miserable? Are we uncontent? Are we not provided for? Well, God is good. We praise God. I wish he'd hurry up and bring my wife home, but, you know, I mean, praise the Lord. He's good, and, and, and he is bringing people into a relationship with him, and he is using my wife in, in ways that, that I, I, I don't understand. I, I can't even count the people that you know, have written me and said that God has done things in their life through our story. You know, if it's you, you know, a friend of ours died of cancer, and you know, it's just so that through watching me learn to trust God with my kids, that she had learned to trust God with hers. It's it's nothing that we've done except for be faithful to the Lord and allow Him to use us. You know, I see my wife in prison. You know, she she gets in there doesn't know anybody, has never had a speeding ticket, <laughs> and is now in this foreign land, <laughs> just kind of thrust into the middle of it. And the Lord begins to open doors for ministry. Now, initially Hannah was in isolation, and she still led the women in cells next to her <laughs> to the Lord. She's in, in county jail here. She's actually able to minister to a girl that is in just a really bad situation through a hole in the wall where she begins to just share the gospel with her and minister to her. And even in the midst of her turmoil and her trial, this, this woman begins to see people coming to minister to my wife who actually care and love about her. And, and they sit out in the parking lot and, and sing worship songs and hold up banners with the words on them so that my wife can worship with them. And that just begins to minister to those people in the jail, and, and there are people that come to know the Lord that way. And so when she was finally put in a, in a state facility where there would be many more women. She goes in and people begin to, to just kind of fall into her lap who just need to be loved and shown what it means to truly walk with the Lord. And God has given her countless opportunities to minister and to share the love of, of God. And it's nothing that she's done except be faithful to him in the midst of her trial. In here, God is just doing amazing things. There's, you know, we've been, I've been doing Bible study since I got in here with people and the church sends in studies and I just, you know, it started out with just one or two women. And, um, and now there's this, the, this last study that we uh, ordered, 23 women ordered the study from the church. Through this trial, other people have been encouraged and strengthened. That's our, our prayer all the time, is that people would continually be affected by their story. And also, myself as a pastor, I've been able to encourage other pastors. Because you don't look for trials like this. But they say, okay, you jumped in feet first because this is what you're supposed to do as a shepherd. And other pastors have been encouraged by that as well. And just go down the list. Just go down the list because you hear this story at every level people are ministered to. So even though it looks bad on the outside, it's creating a far surpassing glory for eternity. And the second that we step through that veil into heaven, it is all worth it. And the glory stays and the pain leaves. 
And we know this. We believe what the scriptures say. Hannah believes what the scriptures say. We have this conversation often that in heaven, all of this will be worth it. We can't understand it now, but there we absolutely will, and that's a promise from God. It says in the Bible that He adopts us into His family and that we have the opportunity to become His sons and daughters. And the cool thing is that through this, quite a few people have had that opportunity. And when we first met Andrew, he was praying for a forever family. And you know, he was in Sunday school class with my girls on a regular basis praying you know, that God would give them a forever family. And we only had him in our home for five months, but when I, when we lost him, we lost a son. You know, we grieved for him just like if he had been with us from the beginning because he was a part of our forever family. That whole idea of the forever family is an unconditional love to where the Lord accepts us no matter what. He already knew how much we would sin. He already knew what losers we are. We don't think we're that bad. That's why we're surprised when we sin. <laughs> he knew we were that bad, and he still died for us and, and saved us so that he could have fellowship with us. And so that type of acceptance means forever family. I, I can't imagine going through what we've been through in life without a relationship with the Lord. And I can't imagine, honestly, why anybody would want to go through this life without one. Because I know what it's like to be in the Lord's family. To be able to have that, that Father who loves me, who cares for me like He does. When we join His family, we become His sons and daughters, and He loves us, and He heals all the broken things in the past. In our family through this, we've, you know, we've learned a lot about commitment. We've learned a lot about you know, loving each other through the hard times and being there for each other. And that you know, family isn't just about growing up in the same house or you know, spending time together, but it's about a love that's, that um, passes all boundaries, you know, and that's the way that God loves us, and that's the way He calls us to love each other, and that's what He calls us to love, not just our family members, but other people, to bring them into His family. Ultimately, I know Andrew was loved, and Andrew is with his true Heavenly Father, and we'll see him again, and he's loved for and cared for in a way that nobody else can do. And there's people that will be there rejoicing with us today that may not have had that chance had it not been through our circumstances. For a few months, we were able to give Andrew a family where he was happy and he was loved and um, give him that picture of a forever family, and more importantly than that, uh, help him come into the forever family of Christ. You know, I, I really would like, you know, I mean, if someone is out there that doesn't have a relationship with the Lord, I mean, honestly, I would just love to encourage you, I mean, to seek that out. You know, the Bible says that, you know, that, that you seek him, you'll find him. And I know that there are people out there that may be struggling in their faith and feeling like the Lord doesn't care about them. And I can feel that, and I can understand that. But at the same time, he does, and I know he does. And I truly do want people to have that opportunity. So I guess that would be the one thing that I would want to close it with, would be if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, now is your opportunity. He died for your sins. He wants a relationship with you. All you have to do is believe and trust in Him. 
and you can have that part in a forever family. Simply put, God is glorifying himself through this situation in only the way he could. Now, why does God allow suffering? I don't know. <laughs> but does he do it for his glory? Absolutely. He, he's done it countless times here. We should be a mess. We should be falling apart. We should be filing for divorce. You know, we should be fighting all the time. You know, my kids should be in counseling and, you know, in fights at school. I mean, those are the type of things that you would expect. And yet, not that they're perfect, but they love each other. And my relationship with my wife is blossoming and growing far beyond what I would have ever expected. And that's the Lord. If I did know what it was going to cost to, to raise this family, to, to be a parent, to be a husband, I'd, I'd do it all over again, just because of what the Lord's done to it. You will turn your ear to me, you will hear my cry for mercy, you will loosen things unseen, what can man You will be my place of refuge You will cut these bindings free What can man do to me? You will turn your ear to me I cry for mercy You will loosen things unseen What can man do to me? You will be my help in trouble You will be my place of refuge You will cut these bindings free What can man do to me? Ten thousand centuries.